HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Introducing touch-free payments from PayPal, a safe way for your customers to pay. Simply download the PayPal app and display your own unique QR code for your customers to scan. Whether you're a market seller, I'll take two tomatoes and a cucumber. poodle pamperer, <laughs> piano tuner, or plumber, signing up to accept touch-free payments for your business is easy. Touch-free QR code payments. Shop safe with PayPal. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast continues to enjoy inclusion on lists of the best podcasts to listen to for Uh, business, sales, leadership, uh, whatever you're looking for, um, like whatever answers you're looking for in your business. And that is because of the guests. Uh, These are folks who have expertise in particular areas of business, and they join me to have a conversation where they share that expertise with all of you. That way you can get the things that you need. You can leave the rest of it. Uh, You can listen to episodes over and over again so that you really get that knowledge that – education, and you can even reach out to the guests uh, to get more uh, help and um, advice uh, so that you can be successful. That's really what our goal is here. Mm -hmm. And today is no different. My guest today is Chris Shipferling. Mm -hmm. Chris is the managing partner at Global Wired Advisors, where he advises and supports organizations of all sizes as they sell their digitally native or e-commerce businesses. Mm -hmm. Chris and his team have built multiple online and e-commerce platforms and completed hundreds of business sales ranging from a million to over $40 million. With a combined 70-plus years of experience working for some of the largest investment banks and digital marketing companies in the world, Global Wired Advisors team offers the most comprehensive financial advice available while ensuring total satisfaction for business owners as they work through the complex 
and often emotional steps of the sales transaction. Through personalized service and strategic planning, Chris and his team leveraged their extensive connections and expertise to target the best potential buyers, negotiate offers, and bring each transaction to a close that properly values each client's life work. Thanks so much for joining me today, Chris. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, we're we're going to be talking uh, in this hour for, about um, a, making sure you have a sale a sellable business. That's right. Um, and this is a topic we don't talk about enough of. I, I'm right. not quite sure why. But so I would really like to start with, could you share with the listeners what exactly is a sellable business? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, obviously it's a question <clears throat> that we get a lot. You know, a sellable business has lots of components to it. Um, and I'll break it down to just a few of those so that way you can truly understand, you know, what is a, a packaged sellable business at a, let's call it 20,000 foot view. So I think number one, you know, when you're dealing with any type of business, whether it's a service business or it's a consumer packaged goods, um, whether you're selling through Amazon or selling through your website or selling through a store, you know, whatever it may be, I, I, I want to tell you that cash flow does take center stage. And cash flow really means the profitability of the business with any owner related ad backs that you would put into that cash flow number. So for instance, as an example, the business may produce $200,000 of net profit, but as an owner operator, you are going to probably run a lot of expenses, including you know, your salary, your benefits, that can include a lot of different things, as well as what we would call one-time expenses that you may have had on the business. That could range from all types of functions. That might be a legal expense, that might be a giant marketing expense because you paid a lot of money to set up a CRM or you paid a lot of money to set up a, a logistics um, software. So there's a lot of components that do go into that cash flow number, but that's going to take center stage. I'd say that's pretty much number one. You know, moving over to the other characters in this play, <laughs> I would say the supporting cast would include, um, you know, brand matters. You know, brand matters because, you know, is it recognizable? Um, does, it, does it create sustainability? You know, is your, is your business just, you know, creating products that are flash in the pan? So, you know, brand does matter when it comes to selling a business. Um, Exclusive, I would call it, I guess the word would be exclusivity, but we, we, we use the term having a moat, right? Having a nice protection on your business that's producing growing sustainable revenue, whether that's you know, a differentiating type of service that you're providing, um, whether that's a product that is your own private label product with a solid brand. Um, may, it might just be a product that doesn't have such a strong brand, but it solves an issue in your life. Um, and so, you know, I would say the third thing is absolutely having some level of protection. And then finally, what we always tell people, and this is, this is just for your own sake, it's for your own sanity, but then when you're going to sell a business, it just makes life really easy. Be really organized and intentional with your books. You know, make sure that you've got them cleaned up. You've got your tax returns. You've got, you know, we, we see a lot of small businesses running, um, well, really running their, their financials through a lot of different pieces of software, but the one that pops up the most is, is going to be QuickBooks. You know, yeah. so if, you, if you've got, you know, a, your, a QuickBooks and you're actively using it, please, please get all of that cleaned up. And, you know, from our perspective too, I mean, this is a, a shameless plug, but <laughs> we have a lot of resources just like you um, as well uh, to help people specific, specifically around um, bookkeeping. And, you know, we can really send them in the right direction to get their books cleaned up. So I would say a direct, a direct 20,000 foot view. Um, that's really the, the, the main components of a sellable business. That's terrific. Thank you. And, and, um, and I love the part about making sure that your books are in order. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I like the part about cash flow too, cause I think yeah. cash flow is pretty much king. It's king. Uh, yeah, it is. But so many businesses, don't really um, know their books. They, they no. don't have them squared away. That's right. And, you, know, you know, if you can't figure them out, neither can anybody else. That's correct. That's exactly correct. Okay. 
So how do you exactly determine the value of a business? Yeah, another really, really, really good, um, good question. So, um, you know, valuation, valuation when it comes to what we call main street or lower middle market. And that's really businesses that are valued anywhere between, you know, six figures, um, which is not, is not an area that our firm particularly works in. Um, but going from a million all the way up to about 50 or, or 60 million, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot that goes into valuation. You know, number one, um, you're looking at, uh, you're looking at everything I just talked about, right? You're looking at cash flow, you're looking at brand, you're looking at protection, which is also called IP, right? You know, you're looking at kind of what, what, what protects the business. Um, does this business just need water? And what I mean by that is, would, would a sophisticated capital group want to come in and pour water, i.e. capital into the company and will it see immediate growth? You know, so the other part of valuation is not just all looking in the rear view. A lot of our time, because we're, we're, we're different, we're not business brokers, we're M&A advisors and professionals because we came from large investment banking uh, world. A lot of our time is actually spent going forward and where is this business headed? Because what you, want to, what you want to do with the market is you want to get them to play a nice little tug of war, right? You want them to, they always want to look in the rear view, but you really want them to focus on the go forward. And you want to try and get the market to pay for as much of that go forward, which is also, we call it a pro forma when we're looking at, you know, putting together a, a future forecast for the next three years. You really want to get them to pay for as much of that growth as you possibly can when you're selling your business. And so narrative, narrative, cash flow, future opportunity. I'd say those things, those, those all go into valuation. And then of course, unfortunately, um, and I use the word unfortunately because there's just a lot of people who sell businesses and they don't know what they're doing. Um, so comp, comp is also something that you have to look at. The market will want you to focus on, okay, well, where else, where have other businesses like this, where have they traded? And you know, it's all based on a multiple. So to give you kind of the, the formula there, what you essentially do when you go out to market, there's really two ways to do it. So <laughs> now you're making me go down a rabbit hole here, but <laughs> there's really, there's really <laughs> two good ways. There's two ways that are, are pretty typical. And the, the most common is you take a multiple and you place it on the cash flow or what's called seller discretionary earnings. And a seller discretionary earnings is just another way of saying EBITDA, but it's used, it, that term is mainly used when you when you have an owner operator, which is probably a lot of the, the businesses that are listening to this podcast. So right. you take the SDE and then you, and you put a multiple and usually that multiple is based on comp or what's out there and what's traded, what's been similar, et cetera. The other way of doing it, which is the more investment banking style is to say, here is the business. It's packaged together. We've given you the cash flow or the adjusted EBITDA or the EBITDA of the business. We've given you, um, you know, all of the financial paperwork. We've given you now the, 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 the look forward, the go forward story and opportunity. And it's very believable. I'm going to let you determine what you think this business is worth. And typically that happens in more of the larger deals um, that go to market. Um, you know, someone that's got $3 million or $2 million and call it EBITDA or adjusted EBITDA. Because once you start to re reach that level, you're starting to put companies in front of what we call sophisticated capital, private equity, capital investment groups, strategic groups looking for roll up opportunities, um, et cetera. So those are really the two things that go in that, that the two views, I would call it of, of, of valuation, how we go to market. Okay. Now, if someone is listening and they're thinking, okay, well, I might want to sell my business and I've got my books together and um, on and on. Um, mm -hmm. How do they determine if someone is qualified to help them do that? Or can they do yeah. it on their own? You know, I mean, well, what's the... sure, you can. So the short answer is yes. And uh, you can do it on your own. More times than not, when it's done on your own, it is absolutely, uh, it absolutely more than not ends in lots of tears. Um, it's an arduous process when done correctly. Um, it is a, uh, it's a detailed process. Um, and, you know, frankly speaking, if you want a successful transaction that maximizes value, uh, you, you want to, you want to use a firm that, 
has the career experience. They've got the skill set to execute on, on your particular, what we call trade. Um, and, and they've got the acumen to understand uh, your industry, your business, and also the ability to do very good research on your particular business industry, et cetera. Um, so yes, you can, when you're really trying to vet out a good firm, there's a couple things you want to ask, you know, we do get asked for references and that's not a problem. Um, we don't mind sharing them. It gets a little bit hairy with references in our world because there's just so much, there's so much um, legal work that goes into the contract that we, that we, uh, that we write yeah. with our clients. And so, you know, lots of NDAs, lots of not, you know, lots of things that, that, that should not be discussed, but nonetheless, you know, we will give references. That's not a problem. But most importantly, you want to see one, um, you know, their work. And, you know, a work product is going to be the offering materials that they use to go to market. Offering materials do matter. It's the way that your business is positioned. It's the way that a potential buyer or counterparty is going to be viewing. It's the first time they're taking a look at your particular business. And so you want to make sure that the offering materials being used is going to be, going to be something that could be placed inside of a boardroom. So you want to make sure that the, that the, that the work product is good. You know, secondly, you want to ask about process. Please ask about process. What I mean by that is, how does your firm take a business to market? Walk me from start to finish. Because that's really going to matter for a lot of different reasons. And that's really, in my opinion, the process is what starts to, to separate, I would call it the wheat from the chaff. You know, the really good firms versus the firms that are just, they're just okay. Um, and they're just looking to do a transaction for themselves at the expense of the seller or the expense of the business they're taking to market, right? So wow, yeah. it matters, it really does. And, and unfortunately yeah. what's happened, and you know, this is one of the reasons why uh, you know, it's, it's very rewarding, but you know, this is reason one out of, of, of a lot of reasons why we left, we left large enterprise institutional investment banking world, large corporate world, and we stepped into a role where we're servicing small business because they, they just deserve so much better. And yeah. the, process, the process that they deserve is so much better. I mean, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the success has been built on the back of a lot of just blood, sweat, and tears with small businesses. You don't feel it as much with large corporations or at all because all of that was done a long time ago typically, right? And right. so for, for the business owner, I mean, it's, it's very much in real time, you know, and I would say too, relationship matters. Um, you want to make sure you get along with the person taking your business to market. This is a huge life event. And we would notice that a lot of competition in our space in particular, they just treat it like another transaction. And that's just really sad because this is something that could have been in the family for generations. They might be making the decision to sell for, for very emotional reasons, um, death, divorce, uh, you know, a partnership that's dissolved. Um, you know, there's a lot of emotion that goes into these, into this decision. And, you know, the, the person that you choose to, to really walk alongside you and on your behalf to sell your largest asset, hands down, it matters. So I would say relationship is also a big component. I think that is so huge. Mm -hmm. As you were talking about it, I was thinking, um, so I, just wrote a book and I had to find a publisher and whatnot. And when I was going through the process, what mattered to me most was how I felt about the person who was going to be publishing the book. Like I wanted to be sure that they loved the book and you know, that they were really about it, that they weren't just doing it because, well, this is what we do. And we just, it's just sort of a cookie cutter process. I wanted right. someone who it meant something to. So I completely understand yeah. what you're saying about that. That is yeah. really important wow. yes agreed yeah yeah and and it really is an emotional thing i i completely agree that people should not be doing this kind of thing on their own you no, want the experts no. right well that's the thing it's like you know um i don't want to compare this to real estate because it's so much more involved it's so much more detailed because you know in real estate in real estate you have a real estate agent um, now the really good ones are very involved and they're really, really good at what they do. So I'm not here, I'm not disparaging real estate agents, yeah. but yeah. you know, when it comes to a real estate transaction, you've got, you know, you've got the real estate agent that's trying to sell the house and then you've got, you know, call it the, the loan officer that's trying to, you know, get you the best deal. And you've got a lot of different hands that are in the pot when it comes to this transaction. And 
when it comes to selling a business, imagine wrapping all of that, meaning you're trying to um, market and subjectively sell the company, but then you've got all this other objective work and that's what a real M&A professional is doing. They're doing all of that at one time. Um, you know, they're, when, when, a, when an offer comes to the business, um, or, you know, when we call it an LOI, which is a letter of intent or an IOI, which is indication of intent. Uh, when we get that from a potential counterparty, um, that, that, that means they want to buy your business. They're very interested. And we spend a lot of time, you know, not only marketing the business, but we spend a lot of time making sure that the structure is correct for the, for the buyer, uh, for the seller, excuse me. You know, that, you know, a lot of times people will want to come in, they'll want to do these large earnouts, And basically it's a way to, to put on the back of the seller, all of the financial risk. And it's our job to say, no, that's not going to happen. And it's also our job to pin other people who are interested in the business against each other. And that's a, that's a common practice for us. Um, hey, we got three other guys that are highly interested and we're not trying to make this into an auction, but we're just letting you know that you need to put your best foot forward. Or otherwise we're going to go with one of these other offers. Right. And then we'll, we'll give some, and again, we're doing all of this work. All of this is on our back. You know, we're not involving the, the client, but, but as, as little as possible. And that's a big difference between a broker, a business broker and an M&A professional. Okay. I, I see. So, and what's funny is right before you said the thing about real estate, that's exactly what I was thinking. That yeah. Part of the reason why people don't sell their own house, it's right. because they're too emotional about it and they need yeah. to leave that's right. and let someone else that's a good do point. all a really of the good point. work. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Yeah. That's right. Okay. I'm going to take a quick sponsor break and then I have some more questions for you. Okay, great. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. And if you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are Your Oxygen Mask First by Kevin Lawrence and The Ultimate Sale by Justin Goodbread. So visit audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, explore the books that are of interest to you, and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today we're speaking with Chris Schipferling about selling your business successfully. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, Chris. Yes. Will you share with the listeners the four myths of selling your business, please? Yeah. So uh, we actually have a white paper on our um, website uh, specifically talking about these myths. So I'll try and go through a couple of them that, um, that, uh, that might be more common. Um, you know, one of the myths is I need to wait to sell my business. I need to wait till I reach X in order to sell my business, which frankly speaking, just is not true. The reason why it's not true is because if you have a healthy growing business, you know, one of the things that at least a firm like ours is very good at is making sure that we're gonna paint all of that potential growth in the best possible light versus you having to sit there and go, well, I gotta work six more months and then I gotta to get to X and then I think I can sell. You know, <laughs> if you've got all of the characters in, that, in, the, in the call it sell your business play that I mentioned earlier, right? You've got good cash flow, good growth, good protection, good brand. You've got, you know, your, your books are very clean. Well, at that point you have a very good sellable business. And now one of the things too, just as a, a shameless plug, <laughs> we do a we do complimentary consultations um, with clients all the time, and we get very very detailed in their business intentionally. We sign NDAs, we ask for financial documents, and during that time, we're going to let you know as experts who do this all the time if you've got a business that is ready to go to market. Since we don't look at businesses going to market as transactions, and we look at them as true life events, we're going to counsel our potential clients whether to wait or whether to, hey, you've got a business, if you like, you can go to market now. Um, we have, you know, we had a business that, uh, that we were able to sell back in April and we sold it for a substantial amount of cash. They came to us, um, small business, two partners, very small support staff. They were growing like a weed and they came to us in um, February, the year prior the business closed. And we told them, you're not ready to go to market yet. You'll, you still need X, Y, and Z. 
um, which they were able to execute on. We took them to market in um, September and we successfully closed the deal back in um, uh, late March, early April. And so, you know, there, there are going to be cases where we're not just, we're not trying to take a bunch of businesses, our firm in particular, like spaghetti and just throw it against the wall and hope something sticks. You know, we want to make sure that what we're taking to market in terms of a, of a business is ready to go to market. But that is a common myth. People think, oh, well, you know, wait, wait, I got to wait, you know. So another common myth is um, my CPA or my attorney is the best party to sell my company. And unfortunately, oh. that's a myth. Um, you know, CPAs and attorneys are very, very good at what they do. But unfortunately, uh, they are not M&A advisors. Now, they may have a role and they may have played a role in selling a business, but there are so many very specific um, skill sets, I would say, and components to selling your business that you, you want to be very careful just trying to quote unquote, maybe save a buck or two by just using my buddy who's an attorney. We've seen that happen before, and I'm telling you, it does not end well. In fact, we saw it happen, and that particular client decided to go with the attorney friend and is now back to us, um, seriously, just happened about a month ago, came back to us and said, you were right, you were us. congratulations, that was terrible. <laughs> And so, uh, so it's never, it's never a good thing to just think, oh, well, this guy has either, you know, put together financial documents for a potential transaction or, um, or, you know, as an attorney has worked in the actual documents, um, to think that they're, they're good, they're a good fit to actually market your deal. So I'd say there's two. And then, you know, like I, like I mentioned, we have a white paper and I would go to, um, our website, which, you know, will be all over this episode, globalwiredadvisors.com, go to our section where the white papers, and we've got other white papers outside of, of just this as well, but we do have one that's, that is specific to um, the misconceptions of, of taking your business to market. Terrific, thank you. Now, um, can you, and I don't expect you to go into like a whole bunch of depth here, but could you, walk us through like what the process looks like, what someone could expect if they decided to sell their business? Yeah, absolutely. So the process looks something like this. Um, and to your point, I'll, I'll be I'll be succinct or as succinct as I possibly can with this. Um, you know, the, 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 the first conversation um, is all about consultation. Let's take a look under the hood. Let's see if your business is marketable. Let's, let's go through an interview process. And you know, that's, that's a big thing that we discuss around here a lot. We interview the client just as much as they interview us. And it goes back to what I said earlier. We wanna make sure that if we're going to market, we're not just taking everything to market. We also wanna make sure that the businesses going to market that are branded with our firm, uh, are quality businesses that our buyer network wants to look at. So um, you know, we, we talk through all the different components of your business. We look at your financials. We look, we dig into your financial documents and we'll give you a valuation range. When you're ready to go to market, we sign what's called an engagement letter that it, it maps out the scope of work. It maps out all of the, all of the things that are going to be very important um, when it comes to the, the entire sale process from start all the way till close. Um, once we're engaged, we spend um, a significant amount of time with you as the as the business um, as the business owner, understanding your business in more depth and putting together our offering materials. Because our whole our whole thing here at Global is, we want to make sure that we know your business better than you. Because when we're selling and marketing the company, we've got to really understand every single component. Because we don't want to come back to you every single day asking you lots of questions. That's just really annoying. <laughs> to be frank. Yeah. And so we want to not be annoying. And uh, so once we're, once we're done gathering all of our information, we take you to market. And usually what we tell people from the time that we sign the engagement letter till the time that we get to a full closing, strap your seatbelt on for about six months. You know, sometimes it can go quicker. It can be four months, but for the most part, it's about six months. And, and, and honestly, it can even go longer than that because unfortunately, you know, deals can die, right? Yeah. Some, somebody wants to buy the business, but something something spooked them or something they found they didn't like, or, you know, the, the, the seller didn't really like the structure or rethought about the structure, all types of different examples. But, you know, so about six months could be a little bit longer, but that's a, probably a good sales um, cycle. Um, but then once, 
someone raises their hand and you know learned what they've learned they, they put what we've talked about earlier an IOI and which typically moves right into an LOI an LOI may or may not be exclusive um, and it effectively outlines how the buyer wants to buy the business including structure financing how they want the business owner involved after the sale um, and all of the different terms and structure of the particular sale so in uh, while you're in LOI the good news for anyone using our firm we're going to do all of our due diligence up front so we're just going to make sure that you guys fully um, are fully locked and loaded when we go to the closing period um, there's no what we call easter eggs that are found by the the counterparty mm. And we'll walk through all of that too. If they end up finding something because it wasn't disclosed, we'll walk through all of that. That's not a problem. Um, but that's really what happens is it's due diligence. And then of course, depending on how the buyer is financing the deal, during that time, all of the closing documents, the asset purchase agreement, um, all of those closing docs are being finalized and being negotiated. And then also, you know, depending on the type of financing that uh, the buyer is utilizing, that is also being worked on um, simultaneously. So lots of SBA loans are used in businesses that are typically under $5 million in purchase price or in what we call enterprise value. And then mostly over 5 million, um, it's a lot of call it personal wealth, personal capital or private equity um, capital investment groups or strategics. And they'll just, it'll be an all straight cash sale. Um, those tend to go a, little, a bit quicker. I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with the SBA loan process. I'm sure they've utilized it. It's not, yeah. it's not fast. <laughs> That's one thing it's not. <laughs> it's very good, but it's not fast. And so yeah. that, the closing just takes longer if SBA is involved. So that's really what it looks like. And I'm, like I said, I tried to be <laughs> as succinct as I possibly could. Yeah, I, I think that was great. And, and it raised a question for me. Mm -hmm. um, who are the buyers of mm -hmm. companies? Yeah. Um, Lots and lots of people, people like you and me, um, you know, might be using their own personal capital. They may have just sold a business. So they want to buy another business. Um, they might pull, pull in together. Um, you and I may go in on a business together. We might be funded, meaning that I've got, we want to buy a million dollar business. So I'm going to bring, you know, $500,000 to the table and you'll bring 500,000. And we may use our own personal wealth. We may go in and use the SBA and use our own personal wealth for, for growth capital. Um, and then of course, as you're starting to get into larger enterprise value, like I was mentioning earlier, SBA tends to become something not utilized and you've got you know funds, funds that are specifically raised for digital businesses, funds that are specifically raised for, for non-digital businesses and for you know, traditional uh, businesses as well. One of the things that's happened because the economy has been doing so well over the past, call it four or five years, um, and really, you know, took a turn around 2011 and, and started growing. You had a lot of, um, and it's been around for a while, but a lot more have popped up with what are called family offices. And so you've got, you know, one or two families, maybe more, or just one, and they've got a lot of personal wealth. You're talking, you know, multi, multi millions of dollars or even into the billions. And they start what's called a family office as a um, investment uh, vehicle. So they will buy many businesses through this vehicle. And a lot of it is um, obviously for, to help mitigate some hmm. tax, but it's also a really good way for them to keep building their personal wealth as well. Um, and then you've got the traditional, you know, private equity. Um, when you're selling cash flowing businesses, you're not getting VC or venture capital involved. Um, primarily it's going to be private equity who like mature cash flowing companies. And then you also will get capital investment groups, um, call it small cap or mid cap. Um, and then also hedge funds as well. So you've got kind of the traditional, traditional um, investment um, type of banks. Um, and then of course you also have strategics. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you sold, um, if you sold kitchenware, right. And uh, you had Acme kitchenware, and then all of a sudden, you know, it might be something interesting for cuisine art and they want to just roll it up as a small business roll up um, because you're doing something very interesting, say on Amazon that they're not, or, you're taking lots of their market share. And so they want to buy your market share. Um, we also see a lot of that too. Oh, I was wondering about that. Thank you. That's yeah. so interesting. That was going to be one of my questions. I was going to go back to for just a second, just at least yeah. with, our, with our process, I want to make it very clear to your listeners during the marketing period, we're only going to, we're going to feel every bit of interest on your behalf and we're going to sell the company on your behalf. 
and we only put you on the phone or a face-to-face -face meeting or whatever it may be, we only do that when we have a counterparty that's very serious about wanting to buy the business and we believe that they're going to pay very good dollar for the business and they just have a lot of questions that really the only only the, the business owner can truly answer. So I just wanted to make that clear. That's part of our process where that tends okay. to be much different than a typical business broker process. Okay. Okay. So in a typical business broker process, um, I'm assuming then that uh, the owner is a lot more involved. Very much so. And, and okay. to a point where it creates a lot of deal fatigue. You know, it's, 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 it's yeah. unfortunate because a lot of these small business owners are very, very good at what they do. They're very smart people, extremely smart people. They built a very successful company. Um, and that's, 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 you know, from a percentage perspective and what stats tell us, that's actually really hard to do. Right. But, yeah. they'll, but they don't know how to sell a business. And so right. we don't want to make them, you know, with every single person who raises their hand and has interest in the company, we're not going to put you on the telephone with them. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense to me. Yeah. And we're also going to coach them if they are on the telephone or meeting face to face, mm. we're going to do a lot of coaching prior to that, to that conversation. That's great. So what does, this may sound like a strange question, but I have a feeling some people are thinking about it. Sure. What does life look like after the sale? Oh man. Well, for, you know, we stay in touch with the, the business owners and clients that, that we've taken to market. And, um, you know, we just actually had a closing dinner this past week with a client that was down um, in Florida. And uh, it was about, about four weeks after he closed and uh, he was reaching the end of his obligation to stay on and, and transition the company to the new, to the new owner. And we asked that question. We always do. Hey, what's life like now? And he said, one, um, it's a little strange. I'm not finding myself checking my phone all the time to see if the sales are where they should be. He said, secondly, it, it put my family in a completely different financial um, station. And it's, it's very, very meaningful to me. Um, and, and, and where I stand now after the close is just in a, in a much different place because the financial stress that he felt when owning the business, um, he said, it's a little weird to get used to, but it's not there anymore. And so, huh. yeah, I mean, look, and then of course, and of course what we do in closing, we're going to try and make sure that everyone's very well protected as the, the transition occurs and as the new, the new owner, you know, takes ownership. And so we're going to do everything we can from a legal perspective to protect the seller and the buyer as, you know, new company is now running this business. Um, but yeah, they do a lot of different things, honestly, you know, retirement's a big, as a big way for, uh, cause again, this is a big, this is a big life event. It's probably one of the largest liquidity events that anybody ever has. And it sets a lot of people up for retirement. So you've got a lot of, you know, um, men and women, both in their you know late fifties, early sixties, wanting to sell their company, not passing it along to their family because they want you know a larger retirement check, and that really is it. So then you've got young people who hmm. built digital businesses that are twenty five years old, and their business is doing seven million dollars a year, and uh, and they're ready to sell because they're burnt out and they would like to go do something else. So yeah, all kinds of all kinds of things, and they once it's closed and they do that something else, they're just very happy buying other businesses, investing in other businesses, and and carrying on in a new life and putting you know this chapter behind them. Yeah, I would imagine once it's over, over, th there's like a sense of relief. Oh yeah, the, the, yeah, the whole thing's over and oh, absolutely, well. absolutely, yeah. there there absolutely is, and I mean. You know, there's also other situations where the business owner is asked to roll equity into the new company and stay mm -hmm. on because they're very vital to the growth of the business. And so, you know, we've got, we've had several clients like that. And um, even in those circumstances, so far, so good. We haven't had any feedback that things have been, uh, have gone awry <laughs> yet. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, a lot of times what happens, especially when you have a business that's call it a five to $7 million company. And, you know, they've got enough EBITDA, um, you know, profitability cash flow to matter um, to a large private equity firm or even a small private equity firm. A lot of times what you have is a, an opportunity for an owner to roll that equity, might stay on because he's crucial to the growth. But in three to four years, that private equity capital investment group 
they're looking to sell, to resell the business when it reaches four, five, six million dollars in EBITDA. And at that point, then you have a, an even larger second liquidity event. Um, that actually happens more often than you think, especially with, especially with business owners who are, who are a bit younger. Oh, that's interesting. I, I always wondered about how all that works. That, that's yeah, it is. <laughs> So if someone's listening and they, they've, you know, heard everything about, yeah. you know, cash flow, make sure that your uh, books are in order. Yeah. What would you say would be like the first thing they should do to start preparing their business for sale? Wow. First thing they should do to prepare their business for sale is um, I would say clean up your books. I can't stress that enough, but call us, reach out to us, email us. Um, and, I, and I say that for a reason because we can take a temperature of where you currently are, whether that's a very small business still looking for four to five years of growth, or you might be a, you know, a, a strong cash flowing business that's got you know, a, a solid mid to high six figure all the way into the millions of cash flow. We can take your temperature very quickly and tell you, okay, here's where you need to go next. Here's what needs to happen. And it's all case by case. Um, so yeah. if, if someone got to this point, they probably listened to the first part about all the things that matter when it comes to selling a business. I would yeah. say book, bookkeeping is really important. Um, but, but at the same time, they can call us just to start because we can give them not only resources, just like you, you're extremely resourceful. We can also help them when it comes to certain functions of the business. I mean, some people call us and we look at their Amazon and we go, yeah, your growth is really weak. We've got, a, we've got, a, we've got several Amazon consultancy um, agencies that only focus, in on, only focus in on Amazon that we can help you with. And then, you know, we actually have a strong partnership with a digital marketing firm that also, also does Amazon as well. And we've been able to hand them over to a lot of, you know, clients that need to be incubated and need a little bit more time. We've been able to hand them over to that digital marketing firm. Um, and they're actually in, you know, in the process of helping them grow their business to a place where it's going to get more value for the company. So that's my advice. Call us, email us. We can take a quick temperature and let your listeners know what they need to do next. Okay. So that's terrific. And will you tell them how they find you again, please? Yes. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought you were going into that. <laughs> yes, I will. Yeah. Um, so you go to our website. Uh, it's uh, globalwiredadvisors.com, or you can type that into Google, or for the 4% of you that are using Bing, you can do that as well, um, and the 1% that's using Yahoo. But you can just type us in, and we'll come up on all the search engines, um, and go to our website. We've got a valuation tool that's very proprietary. It's filled with lots and lots and lots of good data and solid algorithms to really kind of help you give a more comp um, picture of where your business would trade. But, you know, our valuation tool, I'd say once we talk to people, depending on all the other factors that we discussed during this podcast, most of the time the valuation range actually goes up, not down. Um, yeah. Some cases it goes down because people just didn't know how to use it. But <laughs> so we've got a valuation tool. You can, you know, that's, that's no obligation. You can put in all your data. You probably will, you'll get an email follow up from me. You can just ignore me. Um, or, you know, you can schedule a consultation call with, with myself and with one of the partners for us to really walk through your business and, and really talk you through what, what might be needed to, uh, to get you to market. That's terrific. Thank you so much for sharing this information. I think you shed some light, a lot of light on a number of questions I think people have about, um, this subject. So okay. I think it makes it much easier for them. Thank you for that. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for letting me be a, a guest on your show. Oh, absolutely. And listeners, I'd like to thank you as well. You're why we're here. And I'd like to thank audible.com. To get your free trial of audible.com and a free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash business growth to sign up. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, Goodbye and good day. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film. Pip, 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 powder donut. <clears throat> okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the name your price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? 
I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The name your price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Hi, my name is Sara, and I want to tell you about my podcast called Can I Offer You Some Feedback? I'm a business consultant and executive coach with over 20 years experience in change management, leadership development, and naturally providing feedback to high performers. My podcast is for those of you who have a complicated relationship with feedback, whether giving, receiving, avoiding, or seeking. Feedback is essential for our development. In each episode, you'll hear from real people across industries with their ideas, perspectives, and best practices on feedback. I'll also be sharing business bites with you, simple explanations of organizational tools, management techniques, and leadership philosophies that will help you and your businesses thrive. You can listen to Can I Offer You Some Feedback on your favorite podcast app or learn more at evergreenpodcasts.com.